And we're live. Welcome back, everyone, to a new episode of the Wheelie Podcast. I'm your host, Micah Toll, and I'm joined again by Electrex publisher, Seth Weintraub. How's it going, Seth? Good. Awesome. So Seth's good, I'm good, and I hope you guys are good to go with a bunch of new electric bike and other electric rideable news. We've got a number of interesting stories this week. We're going to start it off with um, some new electric bikes. We've got some new offerings from Onyx. Uh, we saw a new electric bike that might have been unveiled a bit early from Vulcan. Um, we're going to hear about a country that is paying drivers nearly $4,000 to switch to an e-bike. We tell you which one that is, but you have to wait about 10 minutes to find out. Uh, and then we've got a follow-up on an interesting story about uh, Bolt Mobility that abandoned a ton of electric bikes and scooters all over the U.S. when they folded their uh, shared mobility model. So now we're hearing what's actually happening to all those abandoned e-bikes. We tested out Bosch's anti-lock braking system for e-bikes, and we'll let you know how that went. Um, and uh, another interesting sort of DIY e-bike story, it's actually my own personal one, where I put a couple solar panels on an e-bike to, to turn it into a solar charging bike. So we'll hear a little more detail about that. We've got a story on a super fast electric unicycle that has a wheel lift speed of 87 miles an hour. So that one's definitely worth sticking around for. Um, and then we're going to finish it off with a couple of interesting stories, one on GoGro's swappable batteries, and then lastly, another weird Alibaba vehicle, this time a $5,000 electric car that barely qualifies as a car, and I, I think you'll see why when we get there. So uh, where are we going to start it off today, Seth? All right, Onyx, a company that we're, we know from the racer and the city, or RCR and CTY, um, launches two high-flying and rugged mid-drive electric bikes for hardcore riding absolutely yeah so um you know just like seth said we we really know onyx more as like a moped company um they're 60 mile per hour rcr and they're like 30 to 45 ish mile per hour cty depending who you ask um, those are both really interesting mopeds but this is the first time they've gone into a legit electric bicycle as in full pedals no throttle like really a a bicycle with an assist motor but these aren't just, you know, any sort of simple European style 250 watt electric bikes. These pedal assist e-bikes are designed as dirt jumpers. So they're basically meant for flying through the air, doing tricks, taking, you know, hard landings, that sort of thing. There's actually two models. There's the base model laser or LZR, and that one has a 500 watt motor. And uh, then there's a sort of upgraded laser pro, and that one has a 900 watt motor, which is actually a uh, Bafang motor. Both of them uh, otherwise are very similar. You know, they've got um, similar drivetrains, basically the same frame with a tiny bit different geometry. They've got uh, built-in batteries. I think it's something like 500 watt hours. It is a 36 volt battery, which is interesting. We rarely see 36 volt batteries on such high-end e-bikes anymore. But in this case, because it is pedal assist only and you're going to be assisting it, I guess they just didn't feel the need to go with the extra power of a 48. And, uh, you know, even without 48 volts, you can still get that 500 to 900 watts from a 36 volt battery. So um, otherwise, all the other components are actually quite nice. You know, there's a uh, really nice hydraulic disc brakes, um, high end uh, BMX and jumping hubs. Um, we're watching a video of it right now where it's like wall riding. It's going downstairs. I mean, the dude's literally flying like, you know, six, seven feet in the air off of dirt jumps. These things are not your typical direct-to-consumer style electric bikes. Uh, when I was talking to Tim Seward, who's their uh, chief design officer, I think is the correct title, but he basically designs their bikes. He was saying to me, like, yeah, if I was riding like an Aventon bike and took it off a loading dock, I'd be afraid that the head tube would like shear off and break my nose. But mm -hmm. uh, these are designed to actually let you just like take it off a six-foot drop and you can land it and do that all day. So, you know, not your typical... Um, direct to consumer, not your typical Walmart style bike. These are actually meant to be abused, uh, but also they don't come with the typical price either. They start somewhere around uh, $2,700 for the 500 watt version, then up to about $3,300 for the 900 watt version. So a bit pricier, but you are getting a lot more bike for that price. What do you think of these designs, Seth? Well, they look pretty cool. I mean, the, you know, what the guy's doing on them, uh, I don't think is a typical use case. Obviously it's nice that you can do that. It looks like he's 
uh, tooling around LA, uh, at the uh, Getty set, Getty thing there, or Gary, I think. Um, so I know this area pretty well. Um, I think if I saw somebody riding a bike like this, I'd probably call the police or something. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, a great idea. It kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, the Zoo's uh, BMX bike. Um, but there's really nothing else too much in this this field. Um, do we know? I don't know. Is that something that people are really chomping at the bit for? Is a uh, kind of like a, a, a jumper bike? I think it's it's really going to be a niche product. I think you're right. You know, most people are looking for something they can just sort of tool around on. Most e-bikes you see in LA don't need to do what this can. But at the same time, if if you wanted to actually go out and, and hit those kinds of like, you know, six foot kickers and stuff, you would need a dedicated mountain bike or, you know, maybe a um, serious sort of electric BMX bike to do that. Not something that you would probably be taking into the city as well. So for that sort of niche rider that wants to be able to do that hardcore riding, but still have something that they could ride to work or to the coffee shop, I could see this as, you know, filling that gap there. But I don't know how many people are going to be trying to fill that gap. I guess the point is to know that your bike can do that if if that, that kind of comes around. Um, you know, you mentioned that there's uh, two different um, levels here. Did I know, like, it kind of looks like the... The bike on the left, if you're watching, uh, has a bigger battery. Is that uh, just my eyes, or? Yeah, I think that might be kind of like the the shadows from the placement there. I believe yeah. they have the same battery, um, but also the the down tube is at a slightly different angle because okay. on the 500 watt motor, all three of those tubes, uh, the down tube, the C tube, and the uh, chainstay, all sort of come together at the same point. But on the Bafang one with the 900 watt motor the down tube meets a little further forward. So that might be sort of playing with the optical illusion as well. Okay. I mean, you know, these are super cool bikes, um, but, you know, not, not crazy powerful, especially from um, Onyx, which, you know, make kind of famous for their moped uh like 40, 50 mile per hour things. Um, is Are these like class three? Do they go up to 28 miles per hour? Are they class to one, do they, have a th they don't have a throttle. Yeah, so there's there's no throttle. Uh, they are class three. And um, so the 500 watt mo uh, model goes up to 28 miles an hour or 45 kilometers an hour. The 900 watt model says 28 plus, or no, I think it says 30 plus. So it's, you know, uh, at least 30 miles an hour. And I think it's one of those bikes where they don't want to say exactly how fast it goes for right. liability, but it, it'll get up there, it looks like. So what you're saying is it's not going to cut out the, the electric uh, assist is not going to cut out at 28. Right. Or at least not on the, the laser pro, the, uh, the 500 watt laser, it might cut out at 28. Yeah. And 900 uh, watts, that's going to get you up to 28 and beyond pretty quickly too. Um, yeah, definitely. And that's the, the continuous watt rating too. So the peak is, is higher than that. What is the peak? Do we know? Is it? Like uh, they said 1,050. I'm surprised it's that close to the continuous, but maybe they have a lower limit in the controller. Yeah. And I have to say the prices aren't that insane for what you're getting here. Uh, pretty good, actually. 2,800 for the low end and 3,400 for the high end. Yeah, I think it's reasonable. Um, and I wonder how long it'll stay that reasonable. Uh, mm -hmm. I noted in the article that you know, if you buy a RCR today, it's like 5,500 bucks. But when it launched, it was, I think, 2,600 bucks or something. So, yeah. you know, these introductory prices don't last forever. Right. And I just saw the pre-order uh, was 2,000 and uh, for the low end and 2,800 for the, the higher end, the pro. That's, that's, that's pretty special right there. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how these go. What is the anticipated time frame on deliveries here they haven't announced uh an anticipated delivery date yet at least not that i know of um i think you know today it's kind of hard to to pinpoint a date anymore and a lot of companies are a bit shy of saying a number and then not meeting it so uh hopefully we'll find out soon if they have a more uh concrete date but i think everyone wants to avoid a metacycle situation with overrunning their delivery date right right well um but maybe like within a year, uh, 
by the end of oh, the year? I think it's less than that. I mean, I think they're, they want to get them out, you know, latest by the end of the year. It seems like they're, they're probably uh, partway through production now f from okay. the, the way they were talking about it. Uh, you know, I was talking to um, James and Tim from, uh, from Onyx, the chief design and the uh, CEO. So both of them seem pretty optimistic. And it, the way they talk about it, it sounds like these things are, you know, getting ready to, to ship out from the factory. And anything else from them on the uh, racer or the city? I know the city was kind of reintroduced recently. Um, any news? Yeah, so the, um, the, the city, I think they call it the city two now, um, mm -hmm. is I believe already shipping. I think I've seen some people have gotten them have reported that the speed is you know faster than they thought it was going to be. Some of them, I think, have set up to like 45 miles an hour. So Whoa. those are already out there. Interesting. All right. We'll keep an eye on this one. Uh, moving on, uh, did Texas-based electric power sports company Vulcan just quietly unveil its first e-bike? Yeah, so this is an, an interesting model. Um, I just happened to be scrolling through Instagram and instead of seeing their Vulcan grunt in their posts, which is their uh, fat tire electric motorcycle, all of a sudden I see this bike and it's like, well, what the heck is this thing? So it's not on their website anywhere. It's not you know, listed as a product. So I start scrolling around, Googling it. I find that in their investor uh, presentation here, they've got this slide about something called the 2023 Brat. And it's not um, you know, publicly released, but they released all this information to their investors. And so it looks like this is their upcoming first electric bicycle model, which would be interesting because this is a company that started with building an electric motorcycle, an off-road motorcycle, but a motorcycle nonetheless, and is currently developing its uh, four-seater stag UTV, which is like a, I want to say like 80 horsepower um, off-road UTV. So, you know, very much a power sports company. And this would be their first small, um, you know, street legal vehicle in a 750 watt electric bicycle. Yeah. So that very um, sort of super 73 design, I think we, I we would call that. Say that. Uh, to me, this looked like something that, you know, a super 73 kind of, uh, you know, design concept. Um, are we so specs wise, do we think this is going to be a little bit faster? I mean, I know it says 750 watt watt battery which is kind of weird should be watt hour yeah. <laughs> uh 1200 watt max motor that's not super powerful um so class one or class three max speed 2028 up to 30 mile range that's not uh super exciting but you know the 750 watt bat watt hour battery yeah it takes a lot to impress seth <laughs> yeah i mean come on man. Like we gotta we gotta get something new here. Um, it does look pretty cool. I think uh, I, I like the idea of the battery being in the down tube, keeps that lower center of gravity, um, and then using the, the the faux gas tank as a storage container. I like that idea. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it works. I mean, it seems like everyone these days is trying to throw their hat in the ring for bikes it, it makes sense for a company like this but uh it just like came out of left field for me because i'm used to seeing their motorcycles and their utvs and it's like what you're gonna build something a that's street legal and b is like finally affordable you know not like a eight thousand dollar motorcycle or forty thousand dollar utv yeah so what do what do we think this is going to cost uh, there's no prices listed yet. Um, I mean, it's not even, you know, officially unveiled, but I can't imagine them charging more than like, I don't know, 2,500 bucks, like more than that. You can't really compete in that market. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's interesting, uh, just from the landscape perspective, you know, last year we had, uh, bike companies like super 73 and Saunders kind of going up market with motorcycles. And this year we have motorcycle companies like we just mentioned Onyx, which is kind of moped -y motorcycles, uh, and here Volcon going down uh, to bikes. It seems like uh, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence in the electric two wheeler yeah. market. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's it's an interesting observation, and it it just speaks to how many different options there are and that it, it's so easy for companies to move into this now. I mean, I assume they're not producing these things in the U S like they are for their motorcycles and their, um, 
UTVs. You know, they're probably outsourcing this to China, though I have no information about that yet. But, you know, it, it would be so easy for them to take a design that looks kind of like their motorcycle, hand it off to a Chinese factory and say, make this for us. Yeah. All right. Switching gears a little bit. This country is paying car drivers nearly 4000 US dollars to switch to an electric bike. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, not the Netherlands. It is, in fact, France. Um, and it's it's not the first time that they've done this either. Uh, it, it started as, I think, like around a 2,000 euro uh, incentive uh, a couple of years ago. And then last year, we reported on when it was increased to 3,000 euros. And it was just recently increased to 4,000 euros, which conveniently is almost exactly $4,000 now. So uh, we can sort of speak about them like they're one and the same. But basically, if you've got a um, older vehicle and you live in uh, certain like urban zones in France, which I'm not exactly sure how they define those, but I'm sure French people know how they define those, then you can uh, trade in your car, uh, buy an e-bike and get up to 4,000 euros. Now it is a uh, like sliding scale based on your income and there is some cap. I forget exactly how much it is, but it's uh, not unlike some of the um, limits to the electric vehicle incentives that we have here in the U S. So, you know, if you're, if you're able to afford any e-bike you want and, and money's no issue, you're probably not gonna be able to get the 4,000 euros, but for most French citizens, this could be a really helpful way to offset the, the price of an electric bike, which are generally more expensive in Europe because they have a lot more of the nicer European brands as opposed to in the U S where we've got sort of a combination of the, you know, four or five, six thousand dollar e-bikes and a lot of these fifteen hundred dollar direct to consumer e-bikes. Not that mm -hmm. they don't have those in Europe, but the the market for the the nicer bikes just seems to be a lot larger there. And so, you know, four thousand euros would really help knock off a lot of the cost of, of these higher end bikes. And and I think it really speaks to um, you know what France is trying to do and, and match the the bike commuting landscape that we see in a lot of other European countries and especially in Paris, where um, the mayor, is it Anne Hidalgo, I think is, is her name, um, has just been so bike friendly, not just bike, but, you know, like pedestrian scooter, like basically, you know, anti-car in a way in bringing Paris back to sort of a, uh, a walkable pedestrian city that you can get around on a bike or by walking or by taking a scooter and that you're not, um, you know, held captive by this this car culture that we see in so many other cities, both in North America and still in much of Europe. So I, I think this is an awesome program. Uh, Seth, I know you lived in France for a while. What do you think? Yeah, uh, Paris by bike was pretty much the only way to go. Um, I didn't have a car while I was there. And I, I used a combination of uh, my own bike. And uh, they had this program called Belib, which I think is still there. But they have, you know, 10 other bike sharing programs. Um, last time I was there... I think uh, with you guys, um, we use jump bikes all the time and line, line bikes and stuff. So um, very bike friendly town. Um, I think, didn't they say they were going to get rid of uh, all gas mopeds or something in Paris? Some I think um, I think gas vehicles in general. I think cars were included. And that's right. Uh, yeah. Early uh, sales of new ones, at least, I think. I don't, I don't think that they were you know, going to take out ones that existed, but uh, I think sales of new gas-powered vehicles. Yeah, so that, I mean, obviously, that's fantastic from our standpoint. Um, 4000 uh, bucks. maybe, you know, that this is a good way if you're a, a family, you have two cars, you got, you know, an old beater, you trade that one in, you still have, like, the, the single car for trips, but you have the e-bike for just going around town or grabbing some groceries or whatever. I think, I don't know. I think that's a pretty good, you know, setup. Um, you know, in, in my normal life, uh, I can go like a week without using the car. Um, we, we, we kind of talk about the idea of uh, giving up one of our cars. We'd save a lot of money, not just on gas, but also in, well, we don't use gas, we use electric, but, you also save uh, insurance money, registration money, um, you know, all the all the things that go along with owning a car. So, um, you know, it's, it seems like a good program for people uh, trying to get out of gas or trying to 
uh, you know, if you live in a city, getting around on a bike is much, much better. So Bravo, let's see how it goes. Maybe uh, more countries will jump on board there. I know Vermont's got a, uh, what, what's Vermont's, like $1,000 or something for e-bikes? Yeah, I forget the exact amount, but they've got a very Euro-style awesome incentive there for e-bike purchases. Yeah. All right, moving on. Uh, Bolt Mobility, which we've talked about, I believe, in the last two episodes here. Uh, abandoned electric bikes all over the U.S. cities. Here's what's happening to them. It's kind of a saga here. So, yeah, right? I mean, it's. I wouldn't say that we're putting like a nice bow on it today, but we're getting close. Um, the, the company that produced these bikes is called Element LEV, and they've actually... Uh, started reaching out to all these cities that are left with these bikes here, and they're doing everything they can to help the cities essentially reclaim them. So when Bolt abandoned all these bikes, you know they were tied into Bolt's system. So you would generally need a, an account with Bolt, and then you'd rent them by the minute, and that would unlock the bikes. And without Bolt operating, these bikes were essentially unusable without being able to access the app or anything. So what Element is doing is... Um, essentially digitally unlocking these things and helping cities set them back up in any type of structure they can. Now, the only thing Element can do is sort of their side of it because they were the manufacturer, they, they can handle the hardware, but that still leaves cities with essentially the, a, a pretty big problem of trying to figure out how to handle all these bikes. I mean, the, the original reason they went with Bolt to begin with was so that they didn't have to get their hands dirty with actually running a bike sharing program, right? They could just sort of rely on Bolt to do all the dirty work. And so now they've either got to find another um, company or, you know, organization to, to take these on. They have to set up their own, like, you know, city sponsored bike share program. Um, they have to you know, just unlock them and sell them at auction, like anything they can do to sort of deal with all of these abandoned bikes. And, you know, Element uh, LEV is, is doing what they can to reach out to all of these cities. And in fact, they were really excited when I reached out and, and talked to them about this because it would help them, you know, reach more cities and, and city governments so that they could help and not see all these bikes go to waste. But there's only so much they can do. And we've already seen images from uh, some cities of bikes piled up in junkyards and that sort of thing. So unfortunately, you know, some of these are going to be going to waste. But if Element can get out there and save as many as possible, at least that's a fairly happy ending to the story in, in the cities that they are able to make a difference. You'd think like some of the uh, employees or ex-employees of Bolt would kind of, you know, step up and unlock these things or at least like publicize a way to do something like that, even anonymous, anonymously. I mean, send us a tip. We'll, we'll get the, get the word out there. If anybody at Bolt is listening. Um, it just seems like such a big waste for these bikes to, you know, get piled up in electric in a, in a, a junk pile. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know how good these bikes are. Like they, I'm sure they're 36 gold and you know pedal assist, and they're probably made to get trashed a little bit. But I still think a lot of people would enjoy having these kind of bikes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, these are designed to solve problems. Right. All right. Well, hopefully something good comes with that. Uh, let's move on. First ride, we tested Bosch's ABS. That's analog braking system for electric bikes to see if it really works. And uh, I, I remember being part of this one. So let's, let's <laughs> Yeah, there you are, on. Seth. Yeah. Yeah, so um, if you guys recall a few weeks ago, we uh, did a show from Eurobike and we tested so many things there that I think we've finally gotten all the content out. This was one of the last things um, to you know cover in detail from everything we did there. And uh, it, it was a fun one because braking is, is, you could say it's one of the most dangerous operations you can do on a bike because that's where things go wrong oftentimes. You know, a lot of people, if they don't understand front wheel braking, or even if they do, but it's wet out and, you know, they don't know the nuances, they can accidentally lock up a front wheel and things go bad very quickly. So anti-lock braking systems, which are standard on cars and are standard on motorcycles, uh, basically haven't existed until recently on bicycles, but they stand to make such a difference and could really improve safety. So getting to test out this new system from Bosch 
was really quite exciting. And it's, in my opinion, it was just kind of like eerie how well it worked, you know, like we would just go full speed, slam on the front brake and you expect to like, you know, lift up the rear wheel or like start skidding uncontrollably. And the, that doesn't happen. The wheel just sort of calmly comes to a stop without locking up. I mean, it's exactly what it says it's going to do, but you almost don't believe that it's going to work until you try it. I mean, what, what was your sort of sense of that? So yeah, that that's a good way to put it. Um, basically, you know, if you've ridden a bike a lot, you don't want to, you know, chomp down on the front brake, especially in gravel, because, you know, you're going to you know, swerve. So we had, a, I mean, this isn't the first time we went through there. We had to kind of feel it out a little bit um, to, you know, trust uh, the interlock. And you can see the rear wheels locking up, but the front wheel um, just kind of slowly comes to a stop. I'm, I'm actually here in Whist Whistler right now. Whoops. Um, and uh, we went downhill mountain biking the last two days, um, which is super fun, by the way. Uh, and, you know, a couple, we've seen a bunch of people go over the handlebars. And I, every time I see that now, after having ridden this, I'm like, that doesn't need to happen anymore. All they need to do is, you know, shell out like, what, $2,500 for the <laughs> mantelock brakes, and uh, you're in good shape. So, um, yeah, it's an amazing technology. Obviously, the cost is uh, a little bit prohibitive, but, um, you know, like it works. It, it works like it's supposed to. And, you know, you can see um, there's a little bit of extra uh, hardware involved. I'll scroll up a little bit here. Um, there's a, uh, uh, what is it? I don't even know what you would call that. Is that like the actuator? No. Yeah, I guess it's like um, it interrupts the hydraulic line. So I guess it, it's an actuator that, you know, um, releases the pressure on the hydraulic line so that you essentially let off the brake or it lets off the brake for you. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, does it work like car brakes where it's like 100 times per second? It's like hitting the brake or how does it actually work physically? Yeah, it's it, it's it's very similar. It's that like very quick pulsing. So that mm -hmm. if it senses that you're going to start locking up, it just like pulses the brake on and off to relieve the the pressure. Right. And um, what is this? So we're looking at the uh, the disc um, right here, but inside the disc is a little extra um, circular thing. Is that to tell it tell? Is it like just telling the the ABS system what's happening or what's going on with this thing? Yeah, absolutely. So there's there's one there, and there's also one on the rear wheel, and so it's comparing those two. And uh, there's a an optical sensor, I believe. So as those little windows go by, it can read how fast the wheel's spinning. And if suddenly the front wheel is spinning slower than the rear wheel, then it's like, oh, you're probably about to lock up your front wheel, aren't you? And then it lets off the pressure. Interesting. Um, and we saw two different types of ABS. Um, there was this one, and there was another one. Which was that? Uh, Blue Break. Blue Break. And they, they're doing a partnership with? Uh, Shimano. Yeah. Shimano, that's right. So similar ideas. Um, we didn't get to test as uh, in-depth those systems, but I think we did ride around a little bit in one of those. Uh, yeah, we were able to do a little. I feel like in my mind, they're kind of melded together and they both kind of performed similarly. How, how about you? Yeah, to be honest, I didn't feel a huge difference. And that basically translates to they both worked well in that, you know, they both did what they said they would do. And, and I couldn't lock up the front wheel on on either of them. So, yeah. um, you know, both of the companies seem to have this, uh, you know, well understood. I think both are on their, their second version of this as well. So this isn't their first rodeo with anti-lock brakes. And it's interesting that they both use different hardware too on the braking side where, like you said, Seth, um, Blue Brake works with Shimano now, and uh, Bosch is working with Magura. The Bosch has said that they do want to expand to other brake manufacturers. They just, you know, had to start somewhere. And Magura is probably one of the nicest brake manufacturers out there. So, you know, it's a good place to start. But I, I will be excited to see both companies expand into uh, partnerships with more brakes, so that you're not limited in the hardware. Yeah, it'll be good to see that. And also as they expand uh, with some competition, prices will go down and they'll hit more bikes, not just e-bikes, but bikes in general. Uh, hopefully some downhill mountain bikes as well.
All right, moving on. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, with two solar panels and one afternoon, I made my electric bike charge from the sun. Tell it's, us about it's cool seeing my own bike up there. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is a fun project that I uh, did a few days ago where I took two 50-watt solar panels and I mounted them on the front and back of a folding electric bike. It was nice because it already had a front and rear rack, so it was kind of perfect. I combined those with a charge controller and basically with those three pieces of hardware, I was able to make a very simple DIY solar charging e-bike. Now it's uh, only a hundred Watts of panels, which translated into, I think a maximum of a, around 85 Watts or so at its peak. And, you know, obviously less than that in the morning and the evening when you don't have the most direct sun. But for a 500 watt hour battery, which is what I have here in this bike, you could conceivably get a full 500 watt hours of charge in about eight hours of sun at about 75 to 80 watts of charging power. That's a bit lower than the stock charger. I think the stock charger is about uh, 100 or 110 watts. So, you know, if stock charger is like five, six hour charge, this would be a bit longer. But it was amazingly simple just, you know, how much goes into this. It was two panels. And you could conceivably do it with one panel. I just, you know, had two of them that I wanted to spread out so it wasn't a giant panel on the back. And a uh, charge controller that basically interprets the electricity coming in. It's programmable, so I could program it to the exact charge voltage needed for this bike, which happened to be 54.6 volts. And then I just plugged it into the battery in the bike and, and rode around, and it charged while I was riding around. And obviously, you know, when I'm parked, it charges as well. So you do want to be careful to park it at a, a good angle so that there's not a shadow from the handlebars or the seat on the solar panels because you'd be robbing your efficiency. Yeah. Um, and we, we've seen um, some kind of setups like this. Um, I, I think one guy was actually able to kind of go around the, the world in a bike not too dissimilar from this. I, I guess he had panels on the front and back similar to this, but... Um, I think the panels were a little bit bigger and it, uh, I think he was using it for some direct assistance as well. Yeah. I think he also had a trailer too with additional panels, if I'm not That's mistaken. Right. Yeah. Um, so, th you know, that brings up a lot of questions like, you know, on the car side of things, we're, we're often asked, well, why don't they put just solar panels on a car? And, you know, the answer is typically like, you know, a day's worth of sun is barely going to get the car anywhere. And, you know, super efficient cars like the Mercedes EQXX or uh, Lightyear or um, Aptera or even uh, Sonos out of uh, Netherlands that there's a, done, a bunch of people trying it, but like realistically you don't get that, you don't get a full day's charge out of the sun. But with an e-bike, a lot smaller batteries, a lot more opportunity to do that kind of makes a lot more sense. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised uh, one of the bigger e-bike makers like Rad or, or Juiced hasn't put together a kit, something like what we're looking at here with yours, um, to kind of just, you know, charge your bike, you know, while you're driving or while, while you're riding or while you're, while you're parked instead of bringing the battery up to your apartment or whatever. What do you think? Is this something we're going to see? Um, I keep going back and forth on it, to be honest, because especially having sort of done it myself now, obviously I see the utility here, but there are also practical hurdles. Like for example, here, you know, I've blocked off the usefulness of my baskets. So that's a bit of a hurdle. If I mm -hmm. was you know, going to use this bike for cargo, it's basically, you know, I don't want to strap things on top of the panels. If it's a rigid panel with like glass on top, maybe you could, but you know, you wouldn't be able to charge at the same time. Um, and then there's, you know, the theft issue, which like I wouldn't actually park this anywhere in a city because someone would just steal my panels. Right. You know, those, those aren't cheap. Those are like 75 bucks a pop. So, you know, it's there are practical hurdles that need to be solved um, as well as just sort of the usefulness. I think that, you know, if I was going to make this more useful, I would perhaps turn it into a canopy instead of the like front and rear pizza box setup. And so that yep. way. I wouldn't worry about my body or the handlebars blocking the sun. And I could also use it as like a shade thing. So I think the the best setup for that would actually be a tricycle. And in fact, that's another project I want to do at some point is take a electric tricycle and do a canopy on top, 
and sort of almost make it like one of those tuk-tuk kind of things that you'd see oh, in yeah. India, like a rickshaw. And uh, I, that would just be, I think, a much better platform for a big, you know, you could probably get like a 200 watt panel on top of one of those right. and use it really like a, a roof. And then, you know, it's a three wheeler, so it's stable. It's not going to fall over with the big panel on top. Um, it'll probably be more stable in the wind too, when you get, you know, like a big gust that picks you up like a sail from that giant 200 watt panel. Right. So uh, there are things you could do to make this better, but it's, uh, it's borderline on like the practicality, I would say. Yeah. Um, the other thing is like, uh, you know, the idea that we could just have solar panels powering or helping to power the pedals while you're, while you're riding. So, um, you know, you're not like you bypass the battery or maybe you don't even have a battery on your bike and you just have solar panels and you ride during the daytime. Um, there's some practical limitations to that. Like, you know, obviously the sun's not, you know, as you go down the road, you pass in front of a tree or whatever. Talk to, talk to me a little bit about like what, why can't you do direct drive? How could you get around that kind of thing? You know, yeah. So or, I think the, the, the biggest issue in the beginning would just be the amount of power you'd need. So for example, this is a um, 500 watt continuous 800 watt or so peak bike. So, you know, when you twist the throttle, you're pulling 800 Watts. If you imagine like 800 Watts of solar panel, that's like I don't know, a four by eight sheet of plywood, maybe even bigger perhaps to get 800 Watts of solar panels. So on a powerful bike, you'd run into that issue first. I think if you started with like a 250 watt European bike, it's closer to doable, but then, you know, you've got issues of what if a cloud goes in front of the sun, you know, and you lose a few seconds of sun. What, what might be interesting is if you could, instead of having a big battery, you could have a light capacitor that you could have on the bike. Yeah. And then maybe you've, you know, got a few minutes of charge in that thing and that can hold you over if you, you know, go through a short tunnel or a cloud goes in front of the sun. Right. Or even just like turning, like uh, if the sun's not too high in the sky and you're making a left turn, um, you know, you might cast a shadow over it or whatever. Um, but, you know, uh, that could work. Like you could have a an electric bike without a battery and it wouldn't give you all the power you need. I would, you know, I would say, you know, recommend like getting a, a much more efficient bike, maybe like a, uh, you know, 10 speed type of wheels um, or, you know, what 700 C, I guess, um, right. that kind of bike would require less, uh, few, uh, less power. So, you know, maybe you get a little bit bigger solar panel, you get, um, maybe 200 Watts, which would get you, you know, kind of close to 150 watt power, which would probably scoot you along at a reasonable rate. It's something to think about because, you know, batteries are kind of the expensive part. You know, solar panels aren't cheap either, but um, it's also uh, getting rid of the battery would also make the bike a little bit lighter. So, uh, and one last thing I, I was curious about your take on, you know, should you get a flexible solar panel if you're going to DIY this or rigid? I see you have both there. Yeah, so I specifically got both because I wanted to sort of compare them. Just like you said, I, I had no idea which would be better. And what I found was that the flexible panel was less than half the weight, which was really nice, especially when you get into bigger panels. It was something like 2.8 pounds, whereas the rigid one was like 7 pounds. These are small panels. 50 watts is not much. So when you're talking 100, 200 watts, that weight makes a big difference. But the flexible panel was a lot harder to mount. It, it can bend, you know, you can bend those things like 30 degrees or so, but I didn't want it like just flopping around on the back there because if it, you know, repeatedly bends and bends, I didn't want to start, you know, fatiguing the cells and, and breaking something. So I ended up just putting it on a piece of uh, particle board, which basically turned it into a rigid panel in the end. Right. So I think, um, you know, if I was mounting this on like an RV or a car or something where I had like a nice flat surface, then that flexible panel will be perfect because it can sort of follow a slight curve and it doesn't need a rigid backing because it's going on a, a rigid surface. But for something like this, where you're kind of mounting it to a weird frame, the rigid panel just wasn't ideal. So I had to, or sorry, the flexible panel wasn't ideal. So I had to kind of make it rigid. Yeah. Maybe flexible for your uh, canopy idea there. 
Yeah, that, that could be good. And then you can even get like a nice little curve to it. Yeah. And I, I see you mounted the uh, controller on the and the phone mount. Is that between the yeah. I, I I think maybe uh, the next iteration you'll have, you'll have a more strategic spot uh, for that. Yeah, well, I wanted to be able to read the screen. There's actually a, a, like a digital readout there, so you can see oh, yeah. how much power it's pumping. So I was like, oh, this will be perfect. It'll be right on like you know the cockpit of the bike. But then what I discovered is that the screen is basically illegible in the sunlight because it just uh -huh. washes out the the LEDs, which is ironic for a solar charge controller that you can't read it in the sun. But uh, my my idea of having it right there on like the dashboard didn't really work in the end. And this is called the Elejoy. Uh, yeah, uh, I got it from uh, Grin Technology in Canada, but uh, you can also get it from AliExpress if you want to wait like four weeks or so for it to come from China. Save a few bucks. All right. Yeah. Let's move on here. Uh, in Motion unveils fastest in the world 87 mile per hour V13 Challenger electric unicycle. This that title alone makes me quake in my boots. Yeah, this thing is nuts. Like, you know, I, I've ridden beginner electric unicycles before, but this thing, like, I'd need a few changes of underwear to, to think about getting on this thing. Um, so the, the wheel lift speed is 87 miles an hour um, for reference, and I actually had to look this up myself. Uh, the, the way they measure the top speed of these things is that when you actually pick up the electric unicycle and you let the wheels spin in the air, that's the wheel lift speed. But generally, the the actual top speed when someone's riding it is less because you've got you know air resistance, ground resistance, that sort of thing. And so they estimate that this thing will probably do like 60 miles an hour with a rider on it, which is still, I mean, the difference between 60 and 80 at that point is kind of academic because I'm not doing either of those. I think, um, you know, in, in terms of safety on these things, obviously the people that are, are riding these are not beginners, right? Like you're not starting on a... 60 or 80 mile an hour electric unicycle. But uh, for those that actually use these every day for commuting, there's really a sort of a community around electric unicycles that really, really swear by these things. And the more powerful ones like these allow them to just take, you know, bigger roads, go faster, farther. Uh, this thing is, I don't know if you call it full suspension or just suspension since it's a single wheel, but yeah. there's like four inches of suspension travel there. And they're they're generally quite convenient. This one, it's it's like eighty pounds or something. I mean, it's it's incredibly heavy. But the ones that aren't quite this powerful um, are actually, you know, you can lift them with one hand like a briefcase. When you get to your destination, you can just roll it along. It's got a little handle that pops up, kind of like a um, trolley or a like a you know carry on luggage. And so I get that people really like these as a convenient solution, something that. You don't have to lug around at your destination like a bike. You know, you don't have to carry it up the stairs to your apartment like a bike, but you still get a big wheel that's, you know, like a 22 inch bike wheel or something. So I get that there are people that swear by these things, but I'm not sure I would ever want to go 60 to 80 miles an hour on an electric unicycle, even in like my full motorcycle gear. Yeah, I guess people who, you know, ride the other ones, you know, the lower powered ones, maybe just get so comfortable with it they, they feel like they can go up to the next level although you said 80 pounds yeah i think it's uh 80 or maybe even a little bit more i mean this one it's just it's you know huge battery powerful motor right. um just like it's it's like a tank of a electric unicycle yeah i mean that kind of eliminates one of the cool things about unicycles is that you can you know kind of carry it up to your office if you're riding it from work or whatever at 80 pounds this is almost like you know it's almost like a motorcycle where if it falls over, you're having, you're, you're going to have trouble getting it back up, especially if you're not, you know, a really strong person. Um, so it's interesting. I, I kind of feel like we've reached the peak, uh, unicycle here. I don't, I don't know that anything more powerful or faster than this needs to exist, but of course, <laughs> you know, we know that always happens when, uh, we say something like that. So I guess we'll look out for the 100 mile per hour version uh, coming soon, right? Yeah, check back next year. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, moving on. Gogoro, world leader in battery swapping EVs, announces 
500,000th subscriber. So with Gogoro, if you're not familiar, the quick backstory is that they make uh, swappable batteries that you can put in all sorts of electric scooters and electric motorcycles. Uh, they, they started by just building their own scooters. They go like 50 miles an hour or so. And they're, they're basically like modern looking Vespa style scooters. But over the last few years, they've signed deals with something like a, a dozen or so different uh, motorcycle manufacturers, including Yamaha and some other big names. So now there are a bunch of companies that use GoGro's batteries to build electric scooters. And the company just signed their 500,000th subscriber to the service, which um, the way it works is when you buy a scooter that uses GoGro batteries, you don't actually buy the batteries. So you've got a cheaper scooter and then you just sign up like a, a monthly subscription for however many swaps you do or you pay by the mile. I forget how exactly it works. Um, and on the one hand, it's like, okay, half a million. It doesn't sound that big. But the thing to keep in mind is so far, they're only operating in Taiwan. So it's like one country. I think the population of Taiwan is something like 25 million or so. Um, and so just to, to have that big of a market share in a single country, especially where uh, most of the country is still not switched over to electric. You know, Taiwan is very much a two-wheeler country where many people get around by scooters and motorcycles, but the majority are still uh, gas-powered scooters and motorcycles. So that's, you know, in my opinion, 500,000 people in that single country is already quite impressive. But even if you just dial down into the electric part of the market, GoGro's got like, I think, 92% market share in Taiwan for, uh, for electric scooters and motorcycles. So it's, you know, it's incredible how much they've, they've taken over there in terms of just the electric sector. And now that they're starting to expand, just in the last year, they've made deals in uh, China, India, and Indonesia, which are the three largest two-wheeler markets in the world that they're going to be expanding to. And in the next few weeks, they're going to be expanding into Israel, which as someone who lives in Tel Aviv is exciting for me because I'm going to be getting a GoGoro scooter pretty soon and I'm going to get to play around with these batteries for the first time. So they're, while well, they're currently only in Taiwan, they're expanding quickly, um, including their first Western expansion. So I think everyone's kind of holding their, their breath and crossing their fingers for when these are going to come to Europe and North America next. And I see uh, we have the Israeli uh, image right here in Tel Aviv. Um, is this actual or is this like they're building it out now or is this just marketing here? So this one is specifically a rendering, but I've seen one of these in the flesh. Um, it was only one of these stations. So I think it had like, um, you know, one tower with 30 batteries or something like that. Um, but I have actually seen that one in the flesh. So these already exist. I think they have 10 of them built right now in the central part of Israel, like Tel Aviv, Herzliya, a few other cities around the center. And the goal is to expand out from there. And of course, being US centric, uh, we have to ask, are these going to ever wind up in the U.S.? Where would they, like, would, would they end up in Boston or San Francisco, New York kind of thing? What do you think? So uh, it seems like it's on GoGro's radar. Because the U.S. isn't as big of a two-wheeler market as Europe, I don't think that they'll be there before Europe. But with the rate that, um, that GoGro is expanding and for most things like this, Tel Aviv is, is, or Tel Aviv, Israel is thrown into like the European market um, as opposed to like Middle Eastern or, or North African. So the fact that they're moving into Tel Aviv and the central part of Israel means that they're probably very close to moving into Europe. And so I think after they get some, some experience in Europe, then they would consider the US. But also it's, I mean, like you suggested, there's, there's so many big cities. So like, where do you start, especially with something like this that requires a decent amount of infrastructure on the ground. You know, you can't just send in the scooters. You got to build the stations too. Yeah. No, it's exciting. Um, we've seen GoGrow kind of grow from, you know, an idea and small um, layout to basically owning Taiwan's uh, scooter market. Um, you mentioned 500, or this is on the occasion of the 500,000 subscriber out of 25 million people. That's one out of every, 50 men, women, and children, you know, including senior citizens. Um, so it's quite, quite pervasive throughout the society there. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see if it happens 
um, in, in any of the new markets that they're entering, which are much bigger than Taiwan. All right, uh, and our last story, uh, Weird Alibaba, this $5,000 Chinese electric car feels like a scaled up Hot Wheels car. And the artwork is there to, to help imagine that. <laughs> yes, I don't know if this thing is really going to get the kind of lift that uh, our graphics guy seems to think that it would. But uh, this is a sort of fun little, I guess you could call it a micro car. I mean, it's shaped like a car. It has four wheels, but it's barely larger than like a mobility scooter. So, uh, you know, I think that if you saw this coming at you in the bike lane, you might be a little bit worried, but I feel like it would almost look more natural there than in a real like road lane with, with other cars. Um, but in fact, I think this is kind of like the way that a lot of cities should be going. I mean, these little cars that weigh probably, you know, six, 800 pounds max. Uh, this one specifically is a two seater, I believe, but some of these actually have four seats in them. And this one goes 30 miles an hour, but in different countries, there are different regulations. Um, I know in the U S there's the low speed vehicle laws that limit things to 25 miles an hour. In Europe, some of these can go up to like 50 miles an hour. So I think if they're classified as, I want to say it's like the L6E or L7E quadricycle, I don't know, I got to brush up on my European laws for, uh, for these sort of weird uh, four-wheeled electric not cars. But the um, point is, uh, there are some really cool little electric mini cars like these out there that function like electric cars, electric vehicles, but are in fact so small that they don't really take up the space in a city, the parking, they're not the same safety hazard to pedestrians, that sort of thing. And so while they look pretty funny, I think there's actually a, a future for these things in cities all over the world, not just China. What do you think, Seth? Yeah. So um, in uh, France, they have the um, uh, under 16 uh, vehicles uh, look similar to this. Um, also, if you get a few DUIs in France, uh, you, you have to drive one of these guys and <laughs> the speed limits, I think 30 miles per hour, similar uh, to the uh, low speed electric vehicles in the U S. Um, so uh, there's definitely a, a need for these um, and in cities, obviously where you don't ever go much faster than 30 miles per hour. Um, and, you know, you could probably uh, perpendicular park these in a parallel parking spot. Um, I think these would be fantastic. Um, I, th I think the, probably the problem that we have is that there's so many different types. No, none of them are pervasive. We don't really have the gr great legislation around like what exactly is this? The low speed electric vehicle thing hasn't really um, been a big thing in a while. So a lot of little things uh, keeping these from the market, but maybe these low priced Alibaba things will will uh, make things happen. Yeah, I, uh, I think there's a big future there. Yeah, totally. All right, uh, let's jump into uh, some of these comments real quick. I'll uh, move the screen here. Um, here's a long one. Given the performance of e-bikes is so dependent on the battery and motor, do you think the e-bike OEMs Will be able to capture much of the value of their products or will most of this be captured by the motor and battery manufacturers or will e-bikes as a service capture most of the market eg i own a specialized canovo and used to default to getting around london but now default to lime as i've had an e-bike rocky mountain in this case expensive stolen before the value proposition and then i think we lost him there but um that solar charging let's see Sorry about this. Uh, continuing, the solar charging hack is great. Oh, I guess I guess he was pretty much done there. So let's let's go back to Alex Ferguson here. What do you think? Um, who's going to own this space? So I'm not entirely sure I followed the the entirety of the question here, but um, you know I think when you look at a lot of these OEMs, I mean there's there's a few companies that are producing a lot of the same parts for so many different. Uh, uh, e-bike makers, right? So like if you look at, um, you know, a juiced bike or another e-bike, they might have the same battery from a company called Reention or those sorts of things. And so a lot of the value is, is really tied up in a few of these sort of mass OEMs in China that are producing 
the same parts, you know, for motors, Buffon would be a good example that mm -hmm. so many different bike makers use essentially the same motor. Now there are, you know, dozens of motor makers at this point, but there are a few that seem to rise to the top like that. And so I do think a lot of that value is being tied up in a, a few of those companies. And then it really, you know, falls on these e-bike makers to differentiate their e-bikes in other ways. Like we've seen, you know, Rad Power Bikes has come out with kind of unique models like the Rad Runner that, um, you know, did, did something new and, and innovative. So I think that's a way that, you know, some of these companies have, have tried to create special value there. Yep. Uh, and then so Alex continues on here uh, when we were talking about the solar uh, hack. Uh, that solar charging hack is great. Imagine electric delivery bikes in the, like the ones Amazon is trialing in London with uh, PVs on them, minimal if any need for charging. Um, you know, I've seen some bikes with solar, but like under the basket. But I think that's just to charge their um, electronics, like their communications electronics, not really their, their power battery. Um, yeah, are you exactly. seeing anything in the public space like that? Not, not really. I think, um, you know, the biggest possibility there would be kind of like these delivery bikes that, especially the, the three and four wheeled cargo trikes and cargo sort of like quadricycle bikes. Yeah. Um, I guess like Alex was saying, cause those are the ones that have sort of the surface area to make it worth it. Otherwise, you know, like I think we've seen some of the line bikes, like you said, have a little panel in the basket, but. You know, that's just for running the onboard things. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on. Call in San Diego. If you're going to make a three-wheeler, use a recumbent trike so you have better height to it. So I guess recumbent trikes are lower. They're kind of laying backwards. Um, I don't know. Uh, probably be more aerodynamic, at least. Yeah, for sure. And you get your head down lower so the, the solar panel doesn't have to be up as high. Though I worry a little bit about visibility with those recumbents, like being so low down on the road. Yeah, I guess the canopy would be a little bit of a something that cars That's true. <laughs> All right, solar racers uh, find that their rides were often shaded by trees or buildings, so they find themselves riding in different road position to soak up the sun. You know, I was thinking about that a little bit. Um, you know, the the shadows. The solar racers don't have much. I don't, I don't think they have much of a battery, but. You know, the good news is when you have a solar canopy or you have a solar panel on your bike, you still have your legs and uh, you can kind of pedal through the, the shady parts. So um, I think that's kind of an advantage in the bike, bike sphere. All right, uh, Alex is back. Could be a compelling use case for LTO cells. Does she be LTO cells lack the energy density of others, but the C rates they can sustain if you keep them cool have been phenomenal in our testing? Are you familiar with those? I think that's lithium titanate, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's a, a fairly new or newer um, lithium chemistry, but I'm not super familiar with it. I, I also think it has super long cycle life in like the you know 10,000 plus cycle range or something like that. Um, but I'm not super familiar with lithium titanate, if that's what it is. Okay. Uh yeah, not familiar either. So we'll have to move on. Uh, Micah, since most of the solar work being done by community already, how about thinking outside the box, Micah, and consider concentrated solar cells and ultra capacitors. Maybe find some university program. Come on, Micah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not good enough for you, Carl. I'll try to make the next one a little more advanced. <laughs> my simple solar e bike. All right. Uh, so now we're on to the, uh, to the, uh, unicycle going 60 how do you break from there yeah i don't i don't even know i can't even imagine breaking on a unicycle from 60 miles per hour it just seems like a yeah. tort, like a way to die i mean i guess theoretically you kind of lay down backwards on the road and, and hope it works right um here's something that i feel like we've seen uh ismail ramos jr asks please review the EO, eora m8 chopper style scooter isn't, I feel like those are like, it kind of looks like one of those Harleys. I don't know. Yeah, I think with the like eight inch wide rear tire or something right. like that. Low, low rider. Yeah, we'll try to get one of those uh, in the review lineup here. Um, those wheel arches in the micro car really spot like the stance. <laughs> I can't even remember that, but let's let's go back to that real quick. 
Yes. Yes, you're right. <laughs> All right. These microcar EVs are going to be the way we do the first last mile to electric rail public transit. I don't see it. Long range EVs making it past zero carbon deep decarbonization. Uh, I don't know if the politicians would, would be able to sell that, but I would like to see something similar. And let's see, we got one last thing. Uh, some of the LFP can have 10 C discharge as well. I think we're back to the LTO there. Uh, what do you think about LFP versus LTO? So, yeah, um, lithium iron phosphate has been around a lot longer, I believe. And some of them do have uh, those higher discharge rates. Like I think the uh, classic example are those A123 cells that came out years ago in like power drills and stuff. And they were basically developed to have, you know, super high drain in a very small package. So that meant high C rates. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly more familiar with uh, lithium iron phosphate cells just because they've been around longer. And those are a lot more attainable. I think they're a lot cheaper than LTO. So that's that's sort of what I am familiar with. And in fact, I'm uh, a little preview for what's coming. I've got an electric boat that I've in the process of buying from Alibaba. And I'm going to put LFP batteries in that one. So that's coming in the next few months, depending oh, on how quick the, the big boat brings the small boat. And did you end up doing like a group buy with that? Or are you just uh, one-offing? No, nah, just one offing, doing okay. uh, less than container load shipping. All right. Well, that's all from the comments section. Take us out. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, as usual, we will be back in two weeks from now, every fortnight, with the next episode of the Wheelie Podcast. We'll see you then.